Good evening, everyone. We will be starting shortly. All righty, I think we can get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and welcome to this uplifting event. I am speaking a conversation on being one's authentic self. My name is Doralyn de Dios and I am the president of the Dominican Bar Association and a board of director for the Association of Black Women Attorneys. It is my honor to welcome you and introduce our distinguished speakers this evening. First, I'd like to thank all of the bar associations who joined forces and put together this incredible dialogue and moment of reflection. So thank you to the Association of Black Women Attorneys, the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, the Bronx Women's Bar Association, the Brooklyn Women's Bar Association, and of course, the DBA. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is a two-part program. First, we will engage in a fireside chat conversation on being one's authentic self, followed by a recitation of letters to our younger selves. We will be answering a few questions after the fireside chat discussion, so please submit your questions using the Q&A or chat features. Alrighty. Personally, I am very excited about tonight's conversation. As a teenager, I read this quote in a book by Paulo Coelho that has stuck with me to this day, although um, I admit that I, sometimes I don't always apply it, but the quote <laughs> read, freedom is not the absence of commitments, but the ability to choose and commit yourself to what is best for you by being true to you. Tonight, we will, to a degree, explore what that means. And I couldn't think of two better people to carry this conversation than these two powerhouse, incredibly beautiful inside and out sisters, Lucy Lopez and Tanya Blocker. First, I will introduce our guest of honor, Lucy Lopez, followed by our fabulous moderator, Tanya Blocker. Lucy is Deputy General Counsel and Head of Legal for the Americas at McKinsey & Company, Inc., where she advises McKinsey's partners on legal and reputational issues, ensuring that the firm's business globally is conducted in accordance with the firm's professional standards and regulatory requirements. She works with senior leadership, including board committees, and has advised on commercial arrangements, corporate transactions, and new office openings, and expansion into new business models, acquisitions and partnerships, professional liability, conflict resolution, and protection of the firm's brand. She has provided leadership and oversight of legal support to McKinsey's New Ventures, a group focused on innovation, including McKinsey Solutions, Organic Scale-Ups, Alliance and Acquisitions, and the McKinsey New Ventures Competition. She's deeply committed to partnering with business leaders to achieve strategic objectives while effectively managing risk. Lucy has helped build a team from six lawyers to nearly 200 professionals and is currently responsible for a team of nearly 70 legal professionals across the Americas. Lucy began her career as a corporate associate at Deva Boys after graduating the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Lucy is passionate about her works as president of the Board of Trustees of Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York, the nation's oldest and New York's largest youth mentoring organization. In 2019, Lucy received the agency's Hall of Fame Award for helping to unleash the full potential of girls she has mentored over the course of a decade. 
Lucy has also been recognized by other organizations and publications, including as a recipient of the City of New York Mayoral Service Recognition Award for outstanding efforts to improve New York City's communities in need, the Latino Justice Trailbla Trailblazer Award, um, established in honor of former Latino Justice Board member and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, as one of the nation's most influential minority attorneys by lawyers of color. She has served on Congresswoman Nita M. Lowy's Hispanic Advisory Board, representing the 17th Congressional District of New York. And Lucy is married to a human resources professional, has two children, and is also a fellow Dominicana. So, bienvenida, Lucy. Thanks for joining us tonight. Mil gracias, Doralin. That's an amazing, uh, great introduction. Thank you so much. Very kind. You're welcome. Now to Ms. Tanya Vlacker. Tanya is the Assistant General Counsel and Director for the U.S. Employment, Labor, and Benefits Group of Energy Conglomerate National Grid, a graduate of St. John's University School of Law. Ms. Blocker began her legal career working at the firm K. Scholler LLP, where, she, where her practice centered around complex commercial litigation matters, including white collar crime defense and employment law. Subsequently, Ms. Blocker served as senior counsel at a few AM 100 national law firms, as well as in the Labor and Employment Law Division of the New York City Law Department Office of Corporation Counsel, where she litigated management side employment matters, class and collective actions. Ms. Blocker's drive and dynamic personality has also facilitated her success in her leadership roles, including as the immediate past president of the Association of Black Women Attorneys and as the former co-chair of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association's Labor and Employment Section for several years. Ms. Blocker has been recognized for her exemplary leadership prowess, including by the New York Law Journal as a Professional Excellence 2018 Distinguished Leader, by the Network Journal as a 2019 40 Under 40 Achievement Recipient, by Profiles in Diversity Journal as a 2019 Women's Worth Watching Honoree, and by Top 100 Magazine as a Top 100 Attorney, among other accolades. Ms. Blocker is also a Center for Strategic and International Studies, Abshire Anomaly Leadership Academy 2019 Fellow. Ms. Blocker currently serves as an executive counsel for the Network of Bar Leaders and is a member of the New York City Bar Association's Labor and Employment Committee. Welcome, Tanya. You're so fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Doralyn. Thank you for the, the beautiful introduction of Lucy and myself, as well as um, that quote that's really going to set the stage and the tone for um, this panel. So very much appreciated to you and for all of your leadership um, of the Dominican Bar Association, as well as your, your, your mentorship. Um, I first wanna, wanna really thank um, the all of the bar associations that participated or are participating in this event. I am excited for this dialogue um, of I am speaking, being my authentic self in commemoration of Women's History Month 2020, which of course we know this, that's just the official um, month for Women's History Month, but as, as women, we are going to support and pour into and love each other all year round every day, not just one month dedicated to it. But that's great that there's a month that is that recognizes it. Um, Lucy, I am so delighted to have you and to have this dialogue with you um, to help unpack really write this question of being your authentic self um, through your lens and, and your experiences. Um, both successful ones and ones that um, may provide opportunity, areas of opportunities of growth. Um, I also want to say this is going to be a candid conversation. We're going to try to be as candid as possible um, and, and vulnerable, as vulnerable as possible, discussing missteps, shortcomings, lessons learned um, for the future, and, and also to look at, right, why are we doing this? To what end are we really um, doing this? So a um, couple of housekeeping, very brief. Um, there will be a Q&A section um, for about, we'll see, seven to 10 minutes. 
Um, so if you have any questions, it'll be at the end of the, the fireside chat. You could feel free to put the questions actually in the chat if you like, or you just wait until the end and we'll ask those questions um, when it comes to that time. But without further ado, what I wanna start with is really a definition of, of authentic, right? What does authentic mean? Um, and, and Webster's Dictionary defines authentic. There are several definitions for it, but the, the three that popped out at me and one in particular, and I'll leave that to be the last, is conforming to original to an original so as to reproduce certain features mm. um, not false or uh, intimidating or in, 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 in imposing or intimidation um, and then the last but not least is true to one's own personality spirit or character and that's the one that has really really resonated with me and Lucy I want to like my first question to you is, right, um, when you hear of the phrase authentic self, um, what comes to mind to you initially? And, and then how would you describe your authentic self? Wow, so thank you for that. And thank you for having me in this important conversation. I am thrilled and I'm so proud of what all of you are doing. This is so important to our respective communities and our community of one. Um, and um, I uh, am just beyond and will do my best to honor your very special request, which is this is candid, this is intended to be helpful, this is from my lens, my experience, and happy to share what I have learned. I am a person who feels very strongly about passing on whatever I've learned and sharing to create the next generation of leaders and help them be better. So I'm very committed to that personally and professionally. So authentic self to me means bringing the genuine Lucy to the table uh, with pride and ownership of who she is, of her narrative, the whole picture of Lucy. Um, it comes with the experiences I have uh, had, where I was born, how I was raised, what my values are, and the principles that are important to me. And that's what I think of when I think of the authentic self. It's without the facade, it's me, it's what you see, it's what you get. So that's how I think about it. And I love the being true to one's own character. So it's not just personality, but to me, it's about character and right conforming to the original. So the original me, not false, the who I am, the person who has a certain number of values and principles that are important to her. And it doesn't matter what context I'm in. It's in the personal context and the professional context. That's the authentic me. And, and so it is about character and values and experiences. Right. And, and I, would, I would describe some of what you just stated is committed to character, value, and experiences unapologetically, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, 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 and without equivocation. Um, which I think is great. I, I often um, identify or characterize authentic self and really use interchangeably with um, realizing yourself for yourself. Um, because I, I think that you can't really be authentic until you know who you are. Um, there are people that can see more in you than you see in yourself. So um, through that lens, um, of realizing yourself for yourself. When did you realize your authentic self, right? Your character traits, right? Your, what you were committed to unapologetically. When did you realize it? Um, and the, the value proposition that you would have to offer, what, was, what, was, what manifested from that realization? Yeah, so, so here's, here's who I realized I am, right? And, and then I'll tell you when I realized I had to bring her. <laughs> because she was there, she was there, but I didn't realize she was there. Mm -hmm. So who I am, I am a girl who grew up in the Inwood, Washington Heights area of New York City. I went to public schools, some okay, some not so okay on the borderline of awful. I then went to a Jesuit institution where I learned the value of the whole person and the perspective of being mindful of the world beyond us, 
beyond yourself. And then I went to an Ivy League institution where I saw a whole different world. And then from there, I joined two professional organizations working uh, for a law firm and then working for a global consulting firm where I saw the best and the brightest. And, and I'm gonna say and and not but, and I remain very grounded in where I came from in the kind of family I grew up with in, in the values that I was taught, the principles of hard work, commitment to community, forgiveness, grace, compassion, hard work, wanting excellence, but wanting not to break other people in the process, bringing other, people's, other people along, all of those things, right? That's who I am. And I knew that package was there, but the moment of realization came later. And I would say it came in two, at two distinct moments. One moment was not so much in my law firm experience, because in my law firm experience as a transactional attorney at a big law firm, I was busy working and I was busy trying to be the best of me professionally and learning core technical skills and doing what everybody needed to do and working extra hard to be even better, right? To bring the best of me. Robot. Mm -hmm. But when I went in house, when I went in house and I had to apply judgment to decision making, that was moment number one. I go in house and I now, I'm not uh, regurgitating the law, but rather applying judgment. What should we do in this situation? What should we do in that other tricky situation? Now I realize that I have to bring in my values. My upbringing, the soft skills, the problem solving, the resilience, the resourcefulness, the compassion, the perspective of a, of, of a world, not just a narrow lens. That's when I realized, wow, I, I want to bring all of those things because all of those things are fun foundational and they are, going, they are actually helping me come to better judgments as a counselor and as an advisor and as a professional. So that was kind of a light switch, like, wow, um, I'm going to rely on the things I value. And then a second moment for me, which was really interesting, it was a moment when I learned from a very young girl. And some of you who know me, who may be on this session, may have heard this story. But I was, again, busy working. And a colleague introduced me to a high school uh, freshman that she was mentoring and said, this is Lucy, she works here, she's a lawyer uh, here, and um, she's, by the way, of Dominican descent. And the look on this girl's face of awe that here was a woman of color at a prestigious firm mm -hmm. walking those hallways, and that I looked the way I looked, that I was not born in the United States, that I was not an, a native English speaker, that I was a lawyer, blew her mind and I could see that on her face. And that's when I realized I have to bring the authentic me to my context, to my environment, to my interactions and to my community so that my community and those girls can see that this isn't a shock. There are lots of women like me and other professionals and this is possible. And that's when I realized the power Mm -hmm. my authentic self as opposed to you know the one going to work and just sh sharing a part of her that's long-winded but I hope that gives you a sense of that journey no I think that's a phenomenal phenomenal response right it brings about it shows the paradox right you started out with this paradox of where you grew up the type of schools that you went to which were totally contrary to right right the, the the ivy league schools that you attended thereafter and whether you can bring that that the way you grew up into that context and have it work and i think the power of that is important I, my question then becomes right you said these instances almost these aha moments or coming to jesus moments where you realize judgment could be applied and reflection right the, the student looking at you and seeing herself when that's a, I see that as a journey versus an event, 
Yeah. Right. So how, how, what would you advise, right? Those that are listening as to when, to be a little bit more conscious of those moments and embrace them, those, those yeah. specific moments. Yeah. And, and I think, um, I think that's right, Tanya, because for me, as I look back, I wish that I had seen that light earlier in myself. I think that in my struggle to bring the best of me to the professional environment I was in, mm -hmm. to blend into that environment, but to add my own extra hard work and my values and my commitment to excellence and all of that, I wasn't thinking as broadly about my purpose and my impact and my power. And I think what I would do is say pause earlier because there is extraordinary power in us, extraordinary. We have a lot of gifts. Even the mere fact that I come from this immigrant uh, experience gives me a lot of gifts that others may not have, they have other mm -hmm. gifts, but it gives me a perspective and an ability to problem solve a certain way, an ability to see angles and, and see things, problems through a different lens. Mm -hmm. So those are gifts and I didn't see them as gifts early on necessarily. I wasn't embarrassed about it, but I didn't see, I saw, I, maybe I was neutral about them. Mm -hmm. And over time, what has happened is I've begun to see the incredible power in those attributes. Right. right. And you talk about embarrassed. I think that's something to explore that you weren't embarrassed by, but many people, right? Um, yeah. that, that's why there's a demarcation. That's why they are com compartmentalizing work, professional, social, right? And don't have a desire to interchange them or intersect them because of perhaps fear of where they grew up or embarrassment of where they grew up. So how do you draw down on rights, changing that, that what you perceive to be negative um, and really more internally, because we only perceive it to be negative, at least the way I see it is because that's how people respond to us, right? Um, yeah. so, so internally, how do, you, how do you say, no, I need to have a different lens, a different perspective to view these, all of these wonderful attributes that may not fit very neatly into this box um, in the professional context. And you can use, and, and you can use a, um, a, an antidote that you have. And then we're gonna go into, uh, the next question would be, give me an instance in when you failed up. So mm -hmm. it could have been when you demonstrated these attributes and maybe it didn't work out as well as you, as well as you anticipated. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll just, on the first point, um, I would say, I, I um, the thought that comes to my mind is when I joined the law firm world, and there aren't a lot of people who, who look like me at the time, and I grapple with issues like, oh, there's a firm outing. Well, I don't know. I've never been to a country club in parts of Connecticut before um, because I just didn't have that exposure. And so how do I navigate that, uh, the, the firm outing? Or how do I relate to the socioeconomic issues that come up when my peers uh, at the time who lived on the Upper East Side or on the Upper West Side, I'm still living in Inwood and Washington Heights because I'm still trying to kind of accumulate money for an apartment and rent and all of that. How do I relate uh, to, to that context and share my personal story and background, which is so different from what I am hearing talked about in these contexts and how do I feel comfortable with myself to say that's perfectly okay. Right. We don't all have to be the same. It is okay that a peer is taking, you know, three months off to renovate an apartment when I don't even have an apartment yet. I'm still living with my parents <laughs> trying to uh, pay off massive student loan debt because that's what I had to do to go to law school. So recognizing that our contexts are different, but being proud of myself for that, owning that, taking that narrative that belongs to me. And maybe I could have shared a little bit more mm -hmm. and been a little bit less afraid of being judged for being different or having a different context. But it really, I think would have taken 
confidence in my story, which I didn't have at the time. And what I would say to our colleagues is, let's have confidence in our story because our stories are powerful. Confidence in stories, absolutely. Um, so I guess I wanna, I wanna shift gears a little bit and I have confidence in my story. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm in a work context and now I want to draw down on right, my authentic self. Mm -hmm. um, and let's say it's, it's in a music context, um, right? You like a, a certain type of music. Um, and, and it doesn't work out as well as I anticipate. It doesn't land when I'm communicating this story. Um, how do I recover, right? So, so and, and that's a, a very superficial, so to speak, um, example, but the question really is, right, share an instance in which you failed up being your authentic self, right? It wasn't, it didn't land, it wasn't as successful as you thought. What was the lessons learned? And you, you can start with early on in your career um, and then give one early on, mid and, and, and maybe more season or um, senior level. Um, and, and what did you learn and how did you apply those lessons moving forward? So I'll give you a slightly different type of example to illustrate maybe the point of um, sometimes, or at least for me, I felt like a lot of the fear and the concern was more in me as opposed to in others and how overcoming that is now looking back perhaps more important than anything else. Because if something doesn't land well, Maybe what I would say is recover by saying, that's okay, you know, I'm gonna move on and being forgiving. Um, because sometimes the fear of not landing it right is inside of you and you need to rein that in. And so here's the example I'm going to give you. I had to travel to Poland for a very complicated uh, matter, highly complex matter. And I was much younger. Uh, and um, I think I sensed from the team a hesitation of whether I had this, right? So there's already sort of a questioning a little bit from the team. Mm -hmm. I get to the airport and the ticket uh, counter, the person at the ticket counter is questioning whether, are you sure you've got the right um, destination you're going to Warsaw? Yes, I am going to Warsaw. Then I get to the uh, gate and the person at the gate asks me again, are you sure you're going to Warsaw? <laughs> this is at the right gate. Um, and then I get to Warsaw and I get to the meeting and there are a lot of people in this conference room, in this meeting who do not look anything like me. Uh, I believe I was the only woman, but I don't remember. And they, it was as though I was invisible. I felt very invisible. And they were all problem solving and throwing ideas out around this complicated thing. And I continued in my mind to kind of question, to answer the question of, do I belong here? Is mm -hmm. this, do I belong here? And then as I focused on the problem they were trying to solve, it came to me and I realized, yes, I absolutely belong here. And I actually have a lot of ideas, some of which are gonna solve this problem. So let me get over my own fears, okay? <clears throat> Level up to myself and stop being my own impediment and contribute and stop being invisible, be my authentic self, bring the genuine me with all of my questions. I am a person filled with questions and let the problem solving begin. And it was an awesome experience because as it turned out, I helped solve that problem. And I changed the direction of that conversation because a woman of color brought a whole different level of perspectives that unlocked the problem. Right. I don't know. That's um, phenomenal, right? D don't don't self-exclude is what I get from that, right? Don't self-exclude on your own. Um, being true to self, you you are you stated earlier that a part of right your authenticity is, is your problem solving ability, right? So doubling down on that problem solving ability, and then and then being confident enough to articulate it, right? Um, you know, some people call it lean in, 
but I, you know, I, I like the, the term just, just don't self-exclude um, and participate and add value. That, and, that, and, that, and that, Tanya, by the way, that questioning and problem solving, that is part of the authentic Lucy because mm -hmm. that's what I learned as an immigrant. We had to you know, figure out the answer to a lot of problems. And so at 12 years old, I actually probably had the maturity of a 24 year old because <laughs> I was solving some pretty serious life problems, not small problems, big life problems. And that is part of the authentic self that needed to be brought. Right, no, that's not resourcefulness. That is, that is wonderful. Um, an instance where if you can describe, you, you mentioned a, a few aha and come into Jesus moment. So I, I want to, I want to just shift gears to say, um, if you can describe an instance where recognizing or rejecting where you had to recognize and or reject impediment impediments to you being your authentic self, right? So not internally from others, um, that you've experienced that you know, associated with either fears or constraints that kept you from living your authentic self or how when you lived your authentic self, you got pushed back from others. Because we talked a lot internally, which I think is absolutely important. Um, but what we have internally can be reflective externally. And that may be the reason why we're receiving that, that um, pushback externally. So if you can explore that a little bit. Yeah. So um, I... The instance that comes to mind for me is the not being more vocal when something didn't jive with my values and my mm -hmm. principles. That was me not bringing my authentic self to the table. Something was important to me and I should have called it out and I didn't call it out. And that stays with you for a little while. Now, wasn't a big matter of consequence, but it was a matter that left me thinking about whether I could have done more, should have done more, and would do more next time. But that too is part of the journey, basically learning to find your voice. And I, and I think the reason I didn't was because of that context where I think the folks in the room would not have appreciated my calling something out. And so I uh, took the easier road and that is not something that I can you know, look back and say, I'm, I did that right. I would like a redo on that one, but we've had mm -hmm. plenty of chances since then to kind of set things straight. But those, those kinds of moments have happened to me for sure. Okay. <laughs> longing for what it is what it is that you didn't share what did you think that you should have shared that you didn't um and what the other people in the room how they would have viewed that yeah so let me give you an easy an easy one um uh, one is an instance where a pretty senior person made a comment around uh to a female colleague around your presentation that presentation we just did together yours went better because you are a pretty face Actually, and actually, no, her presentation went better, not because she is a pretty face, but because she was prepared and killed it. Right. And, and, and was awesome. The quality of the, of the work was there. But to not have called that very senior person in the moment is not consistent with my values. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah. Powerful. Okay. Let's 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 stick with this theme of calling out, speaking um, up in this context that we're in right now. Uh, right, we have a, a, a very we went through a very extremely tough year um, with with respect not only to to the pandemic, a COVID pandemic, but also right racial injustice um, that has been permeated and has you know it's always been there. Right, there always been some rubble from from rebel for, from our, our past that we refuse to face. So in the context of, of being your authentic self, um, speaking up and speaking out about biases um, that you've seen has been essentially looked at as being the epitome of authenticity, okay? Um, and I wanna see how have you balanced the importance of 
speaking up and speaking out specifically about right injustice and, and, and biases and in the professional setting and your consciousness of its impact yeah. professionally. So that's, that's a really important question. And I realize that there are many different ways in, we, in which all of us can respond to this. I don't think that there is one right answer. And we all, again, have to bring our authentic selves to these situations. Um, in my mind, the way I have tried to address this has been being really strategic about how I can bring about the change I want. And it has sometimes required me to pause and not act in the moment, like I did in that example I gave you, not act in the moment, but rather to hold and find the right opportunity uh -huh. to have the impact I want. So let me give you another example. Um, a, a committee is being formed. It is um, announced in passing in the context of a big discussion, but it was mentioned in passing um, and the team moved on. I look up the members, the proposed members of the committee, and I don't see uh, persons of color. And in particular, I don't see a Latino. I just don't see a good mix of representation. So what I decide to do is I am not gonna call that out in that meeting with all of those leaders in the room. That's a judgment call. Somebody else may say, actually, my authentic self is I'm gonna call it out immediately. I'm gonna raise my hand and I'm gonna say, this is not acceptable, right? That is not the way I wanted to do it. So what I did is I figured out who is the stakeholder who controls that and I am going to call them gently. I happen to know them from having worked with them in another context. And I am going to gently say, by the way, I noticed the following. And here is a list of 25 highly qualified people who meet the criteria that I understand have been outlined for this committee. And wouldn't it be great to um, have you uh, include some of these folks? And that got the person's attention. And I was fine with having that person take the credit for we've expanded or we've changed or we've done whatever. But for me, it's more about how do I use my power to be strategic to get the result that I think is necessary. Mm -hmm. And it's a different approach for everybody, but that's how I have balanced the imperative against the we need to make change. Right. right. No, and I think where that actually highlights with respect to being your authentic self is, right, you're, you're being your authentic self for what reason, right? To what end? What is the goal um, in being your authentic self in each and every situation? Um, and, and, and realizing and analyzing what is, to what end am I doing this? To what end am I making these, this, this, com this comment? Um, and it sounds like from your, your example, that you gave, like the ultimate impact, right? There would have been a consequence, it sounds like, if you said something during that meeting, right? Whether the, the impact of that would have been worse or whether they would have been receptive to you in the suggestions that you made if you did it in that context. Um, so it's almost like being your authentic self, but also reading the room <laughs> and who's yeah. around you and the elements around you. Um, all, all great, great, great um, talking points and great advice. I'm going to go here and can we talk a little bit about sponsorship, mentorship, sistership, and champions, right? Um, and, and what if someone um, is, is not necessarily um, authentically uh, inclined to uh, network, to, to uh, meet other individuals? How, how can they be their authentic self uh, in the context of trying to, the, because of the importance of sponsorship, mentorship, and sisterhood, right? What advice can you give in, in finding yourself in that and being vulnerable and being confident in speaking up and speaking out so you can develop these relationships, which are imperative in 
to, to be successful? Absolutely imperative. And um, I would say to me, the important point is to line up mentors and sponsors. I care a little bit less about who those mentors and sponsors are. And I would even argue that in some situations, not having sponsors who are similar to you is actually quite helpful. So for example, when my white male uh, senior colleagues and peers show up in support of a woman of color to sponsor her for something, there's a little bit of an unlock there. It's actually very helpful. So I don't mind that we are not the same uh, in the relationship of a mentee and a mentor or someone being sponsored and a sponsor. The important point is to line up those people who can be in your corner. And in fact, the connection to being the authentic self, Tanya, for me is you have to be authentic for those people to be able to guide and help you and play the role we need them to play. So for example, if I take the role of the sponsor, which is to speak on your behalf when you are not in the room and to say, Tanya is fabulous. I worked with her. Let me tell you why you need to put her at the front of this thing. In order for them to speak passionately about you, they have to know you. And so that means you have to have had a conversation or series of conversations with those individuals about who you really are, what you bring to the table, and what you are trying to accomplish, where are you trying to go? So you have to be genuine. And, and this is all part of that same notion of the earlier we begin that process of understanding who we are and bringing that person to the table, the more successful we can be. Well, it's what, what I wanna, and I'm gonna, we're gonna open it up for questions in about three minutes, but two questions I have left that I wanna end on. Um, see is the first one is the importance of you are you know an avid participant in, in non for profits big brother big sister and and you you volunteer in that regard in really giving back um and and the importance of of, of that and how that intersects with your um authentic self right being reciprocal in what it is that you've received um and helping out the next generation um if you can speak to to that being right who you are and how that's becoming your authentic self. And then I want to talk about, you, you brought it up earlier, being, um, uh, having grace, forgiving, forgiving yourself. Um, and if we can, if you can give us maybe some words of wisdom, some gems um, on how we can, we can self-care and be a little bit self-giving and extending grace to ourselves and being our, and becoming our authentic self. Absolutely. So on the first point, I would say, um, to me, community is very important. If we, um, and I know I'll just speak from my, from my own view and others may see it differently, but to me, if we are not pulling our sisters forward, reaching back, um, uh, and, and folks who look by, like us and the next generation of leaders, I honestly don't know what we're doing here. <laughs> because I can do a lot for myself, great, fantastic, I've had a nice career, but what does that do? What is the legacy? What I wanna see is what is next. And we have plenty of hurdles in front of us. And it's just years and decades and hundreds of years of setbacks. And unless we really rally in community in the way you all are doing here, by uniting your efforts in different bar associations and having these dialogues and helping each other, then that's the only way. To me, that is the only way. So I do, I found my passion. My passion is um, helping kids because I see it, the combination of education and kids, that's how I see the pathway in the future. That's the unlock for me. Every kid that I can get through school and to college and onward, I'm unlocking something special. So to me, I, my goal in life is attend as many graduations as possible. That's my goal, it's that simple, it's graduations. Um, and that's my passion. So that's the genuine me who wants to create a better community. It's not about me. And then in terms of grace, um, I, I love that you framed your questions along the journey. This is a journey. I, I'm still growing 
And I, I'll give you an example of that growth and then I'll give you my nuggets. Um, just last week, I did a conversation with our CEO, our global managing partner that was broadcast across the firm where he interviewed me and asked me a bunch of questions. I made it a point to share in that conversation that I went to public schools, that I wasn't born in the United States, that some of the schools I went to were really bad, et cetera. And I did that very deliberately because I wanted to share a little bit more about me so that the firm could see that we are not all the same and it is okay to be different. And we all bring tremendous things to the table via our differences. I never, would have done a conversation like that live for 35,000 people when I began my career. That <laughs> never would have happened. I would not have talked about that. I would have talked about something else. So it's a journey. And then in terms of nuggets, I would say, um, I would identify people who inspire you and stay close to those people. I would do that. I would identify your passions and pursue them early and start early. I would build coalitions. If you have a passion, find others who have similar passions, collaborate to affect change because there is power in our community. As I was saying, I would, um, I heard this yesterday and I've heard it before, but I really like it and, I, and, I, and I've done it, but not consistently, but I think we should. A brag file of the things you are proud of, keep that. Because in your moments when you're feeling like I'm not enough or I don't belong in this room or I've made some mistakes and I need to level up, that, that brag file is going to help you. It's going to help you in other ways too, but keep it for yourself and enlighten yourself with all that positive um, uh, stuff recorded in your brag file. And then lastly, on the point of community, lift as you climb. So don't just climb. Please don't just climb. You got to lift somebody else behind you. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Lucy. That was, that was excellent. Um, I am one, I want to, before we close this session out, I want to open it up to questions um, to the extent we have any questions. Duraling, can, can folks just unmute and ask questions or are we limited to the chat? The questions are in the Q and A feature. Okay. Let's look here. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so one question, um, the first question for you, Lucy, since representation is so important for the youth, what can schools do to diversify their student body and faculty, in your opinion? Yeah, well, and you know, there's a difference, right? Because there's public schools, which we have less influence over perhaps, except when we vote, right? <laughs> Who are we voting into boards and such at school boards and mayors um, in the private school context? So anybody that's got any connection to a private school, please put pressure on those boards. Please put pressure on those boards on the curriculum and on the faculty. It's the only way. So I, for example, went to Fordham University and I've just connected a little bit more with them than I have in the past, but I am asking them in a very interested way, what are, you, what are your diversity efforts and commitments? What is happening? Why is it that when I walk on campus, it still looks a little bit like it looked when I graduated? So it's a very good conversation. It's very pleasant. It's very polite. It's my alma mater. I love them. But we have to be engaged in these conversations and put pressure on these institutions to see them make change and offer to help, legitimately offer to help and be part of the problem solving. Absolutely. That's the only question that we have. So, so now I just want to say, Lucy, um, you know, thank you again. I think, right, particularly, you know, what's what stood out is when you talked about your brag file. We often forget everything that we've done. Um, we're heads down and and just busy bodies, and 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 we don't recognize ourselves for ourselves. We're not um, giving kudos to ourselves and supporting ourselves. So that was definitely um, a nugget that I took and. Um, amongst the others of, uh, right, being uh, confident in your story um, and, and being willing and unapologetic in giving that story. So I want to I wanna thank you, Darlin. I will turn it over to you now. I know that we have another session where we're going to uh, read letters um, to, to our authentic self. So um, I'll turn it over to you now, Darlin. <laughs> 
Thank you, Tanya. Wow, that was incredibly powerful. Thank you so much for such a candid and hopeful conversation. Lucy and Tanya, I just can't thank you enough. Um, I honestly have to say that you are both truly special. The work that you do is special. How you pay it forward is remarkable. And I'm sure I speak for all of us. We all appreciate you for who you are, for bringing your authentic self to the table always, and for the ways that you inspire us. So thank you again. Um, now we will hear from Lucy Lopez again, uh, uh, and also Miguelina Camilo, who is the principal at the Camilo Law Firm and president of the Bronx Women's Bar Association, Natoya McGee, who is principal court attorney and president of the Brooklyn Women's Bar Association, and Jamer Crawford, who is a partner at Quinn Emanuel Yukuhar and Sullivan, and a board of director of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. They will all recite letters that they wrote to their younger selves. Up front, I want to thank you all for your openness and vulnerability. Um, and Lucy, I do want to say again that it has truly been an honor listening to you tonight. I am motivated to always take ownership of who I am and just bring that wherever I go. So I turn over the virtual floor to you ladies. Thank you, Dorlin. Shall I start with my letter? Yes, please. Okay. So dear Lucy, you are going to be just fine. Everything will be just fine. And I would like to suggest that you adjust a few things. Let me take them in turn. First, happiness. Think about how you would define success. Is it by achievement or do you want something bigger? You can afford to slow down and take the pressure off yourself. What you've done and what you do every day is enough. You do not always have to push yourself so hard. Take a breath and seek what makes you happy. Two, self-doubt. Do not let yourself be distracted by the people who don't believe in you, but rather let the people who do believe in you propel you. That science teacher who thinks that your lack of English language skills means you will not succeed, ignore him and don't give him the satisfaction of your fear. Focus on the English teacher who tells you that you can do this. She is, after all, the English teacher. Intention. Three, intention. Plan your career more deliberately. Law firms are great training grounds, but carefully consider what you want out of the experience. Figure out the areas you believe are critical for the future path you want and ensure you are getting exposure in those areas. Do not let staffing coordinators determine your future direction. Identify now the three to five people you admire who can be your mentors and guides and start building and investing in those relationships now. And don't forget sponsors, you'll need them too. Wherever you are, find the three to five people in that institution who will speak on your behalf when you are not in the room. Your hard work will not be enough. And stay connected to the search firms. They will pay, play a critical role as you consider options along the way. And by the way, you should consider your options often. Four, community. I know you care a lot about this and that you are looking around and seeing how many girls like you have no one to guide them. Grow as much as you can so that you can reach back and help others, but start connecting to your community now. There are others like you. Find them so that you can support each other now. You are not alone. Five, self-investment. Don't put off the things you love. You enjoy writing, so start writing now. I realize that you don't see writing as an option because your family made sacrifices to give you the opportunity to advance economically, but that's their dream. It's okay for you to have your own dream. If what you want is not on the menu, write it in. You are your most important investment. And finally, six, power. Let's touch on the holistic you. As a young girl new to the United States, you thought you needed to assimilate, learn a, new learn a new language and blend in to fit in. Know that you do not have to give up who you are or where you come from. You are a woman, a person of color, brown, 
immigrant, native Spanish speaker, a translator, problem solver, determined bridge between your family's old world and your new world. Worried about the hardships in your family and in your community, working after school while in middle school. Bring the power of those experience, experiences forward. Be visible and let them see who you are. That's it for me, Jorlin. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Up next is Miguelina Camilo. Uh, Dora, if you want me to be on video, you just have to help me out with that. Okay, great. And that was pretty hard to go after Lucy because Lucy, I just want to be like you. <laughs> um, dear younger Miguelina, for some reason, your mind is always racing and most of the time overthinking things that you can no longer control. You give power to your fears, not realizing that the reason that your mind is always racing is because your inner spirit knows all that you are capable of. You move through your day being self-conscious and not wanting to be seen because you don't like what you see. You feel heavy and overwhelmed with wanting to be perfect. You have no guidance as to what a strong woman looks like because you are the oldest, the first, and you've been taught that sharing emotions is a sign of weakness. The guilt and shame that is masked as love by our families is not something you need to keep carrying. It will take you years to learn, but I will tell you now, don't model the habit of giving so much that you expect praise, but are left feeling empty. Younger Miguelina, you are so much stronger than you know. Never dim your light because you think it's better to not interrupt or have an opinion. And don't always apologize because you were taught that your words were sometimes too much or unwanted. The joy, the joy you will feel from freeing your inner drive will be the main force to keep you going forward. I promise you that ease will come the more you embrace the discomfort of facing yourself. You are the unique result of your own particular trauma in your life. And through all the difficult situations you will face, the constant will be knowing who you are. You will see that no one will bring what you can bring to the table because no one else is you. The most magical thing that will happen is that you will see yourself in women who came before you and flourished. You will also gather with women after you who will see in you the support they seek. This will create a steady source of strength you always craved for others and for yourself. And so younger Miguelina, don't waste another minute doubting and trust that you will shine in the light that the universe has cast for you. And PS, <laughs> don't get married to that first guy you live with. Your family won't be mad at you if you're not married or don't have babies by the time you're 25 or even 35. You can't plan for everything in life, but rest assured, all will come at the right time and your life will be dope. Bess, future Miguelina. Dear Joe Mayer, I'm writing this letter to you as your 34 year old self. I wanna to talk to you for a minute about authenticity. Weird subject, right? I know. I mean, what does a little black girl from Queens need to know about authenticity? Well, I'm glad you asked. Someday you'll get this crazy idea to become a lawyer. You'll be the first lawyer in your family. You'll study for the LSAT. You'll even get into Yale. You'll feel like a hometown hero overnight. Practically everyone you've ever met in your entire life will tell you they're rooting for you. And they'll really mean it too. They'll send you off to law school with money, gifts, wise words. But you'll step foot on campus in New Haven and your excitement will quickly fade. Where are all the fierce and unapologetic black women you'll wonder? Like the ones you grew up with, the ones in your family, the teachers you had in school. I guess smart and bold black girls from Queens don't get into fancy Ivy League schools every day. Don't worry, you'll find some, but you'll be so, so disappointed by their absence. Try not to be. These institutions weren't built for us. On campus, people will be intrigued by you, but they won't quite know how to engage. 
Is she rich? Is she poor? Is she like us? Or is she one of those Blacks? You'll meet a lot of people who struggle with their own identity. Don't let their insecurities force you to question your own. You'll feel pressure to assimilate and code switch. Resist those temptations. Develop comfort with your own voice and find your own way of showing up in this world as a Black woman. Find people who share your love of culture, art, community. Find community. And if you can't, sorry, find, find community. And if you can't find it, create it. I promise you, it's no substitute for Queen, but it'll help you get over the hump. And after a three long year stretch, you'll graduate from Yale and you'll start working at a major New York City law firm. Some of your white classmates will even rediscover you once they see you thriving. They'll want to know your secrets to success. They'll want to know how you make the grind look so damn good. Let them take you out to lunch or coffee. Be friendly, but keep them guessing. Your white colleagues and your clients will shower you with praise for being articulate. Your annual reviews will note how smart and sharp you are. By the time you get my age, though, you'll realize none of their praise matters. Why? Because you don't need their validation. Stay grounded. Be humble. Know that you are always enough. Just like your first grade teacher taught you all those years ago, and mom and dad and everybody else along the way. Never stop believing them, ever. Don't shrink to make others comfortable. Don't strive to be an unassuming black woman. Stand tall. Trust your intuition. Take risks. Make mistakes. But through it all, keep your confidence. The native New Yorker in you knows exactly what I'm talking about. No law firm and no law degree can teach you that. Stay the course, even when you feel invisible, questioned, or alone, because trust me, those things will happen. Girls and women everywhere are looking up to you and counting on you. And in case no one told you this today, keep fighting for them. Keep opening doors for them. Keep representing them. It's one of your many superpowers. You've already made me proud, young Joe Mayer. So as grandma used to say, everything from here is just icing on the top. Thank you. Natoya, it's your turn. Okay, thank you. So I want to thank everyone for sharing. Hi, uh, my name is Natoya McGee. I'm the president of the Brooklyn Women's Bar Association. So I just want to say that I had a very difficult time writing a letter to my authentic self. I'm still learning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close out the program with a story because that's what I'm good at, stories and not letters. So I... Um, I had a case, I started my practice in criminal court as a public defender. I remember having a case that was ready to go to trial and um, I was being sent out to a judge in Supreme Court. And I went around the office to ask my colleagues about that judge because I wanted to be prepared. And what I heard was that he doesn't like women. He doesn't like minorities, right? I'm sorry that you have a case in front of him. That was his reputation. I appeared in front of the judge. I thought I was prepared. And I thought the judge was fair in its legal rulings because the case law was on my side. But I don't know what it was and I can't explain it. But I think when he saw me, it was instant disdain, like I had offended him somehow by appearing in his courtroom. And during the hearing, he kept on saying to me, I cannot understand what you're saying. Can you speak properly? And I kept thinking to myself, the reporter seems to understand what I'm saying. 
I am making my arguments, starting to my cases, pulling out copies of my cases. And he was so angry, so angry that he was actually ruling in my favor. And he said to me, your hands, why do you keep putting your hands up? I apologize and try to keep my hand down. I remember that the ADA on the case also had, he had, a, had a, a Russian accent. And I remember the court reporter telling that ADA to repeat himself. And when I, at one point, didn't catch a statement and asked the ADA to repeat himself, the judge got very angry at me. And at one point, I looked around the courtroom. My client was white. The assigned assistant was white. Even my colleague who had asked to sit in the audience with me and shadow me, he was white. And the judge was a white male. I suddenly felt out of place, like I did not belong. And at the end of the hearing, the judge said to me, Miss McGee, Maga McGee, couldn't really pronounce my last name, that I don't like what you're doing. I don't know what it is, but if you come back into my courtroom like this, you're not going to enjoy doing a jury trial in front of me. I had no idea what he was talking about. I never appeared in front of him before, but in that moment, I felt like my very existence as a human being offended him. And it's hard to express how I was feeling or exactly what he was projecting upon me, but I had to use my instinct. And I felt at that point that somehow my appearance had offended that judge. And at that time I was transitioning from a relax, relaxer to a natural hair. I was wearing my braids for about a year. I took my braids out and I was rock, rocking my Afro. I went home, I looked in the mirror and I said to myself, this is too much. The hair, the accent, what can I change about myself? I couldn't change the color of my skin. I couldn't change the fact that I was a woman and I couldn't do anything about the accent, I'm a Jamaican. But what I could do was change my hair, that I could control. And that night, instead of preparing for a trial, I spent the night twisting and tucking, uh, doing a protective style to make sure all my hair was pinned up and tucked in because I did not want any part of me having an afro to show. And I tried to justify what I did, that the only person I was thinking about was my client, that I didn't really think wasn't thinking about myself that I had to appear in front of this judge the next day and I didn't want my appearance to affect my client's case or the way a juror would perceive me because of the way the judge was treating me. I've had a few experiences with my accent and my hair and I'm sure some of you have also. But in that moment, I looked in the mirror and tried to change myself because I didn't like the way the judge saw me. Of course, the Natoya today, I would tell her that she shouldn't have pinned her hair back. I would have told the Natoya today to go home and to make that Afro bigger. I would have walked in that courtroom. I would have said, be respectful. I would have said, be prepared. And I would have said, you are not your hair. You are not your accent. You're not the color of your skin. You are prepared and you're skilled. And this is where mentorship comes in. Back to what Lucy and Tanya touched upon. Mentorship and having people around you to help you through these difficult transition, to mentor you and to guide you. And I can imagine one of my mentors saying now, address that issue head on, approach the judge and, you know, figure out what the issue is. But I'm fortunate um, to be in this position, to be a bar leader, to be a mentor. I'm grateful that we are having discussions like this. I'm inspired by all the other bar leaders who share their stories and we have a big responsibility to mentor, to guide, and to advise these new attorneys and let them know that, you know, these things, your hair, your accent, the color of your skin, that does not define you or make you a good or bad attorney. So with that, I am going to close out tonight. I want to say... Thank you very much for joining us on behalf of the Association of Black Women Attorneys, the Bronx Women's Bar Association, the Brooklyn Women's Bar Association, the Dominican Bar Association, the Metropolitan Black Bar. I hope that you enjoyed the program. I certainly did, did. Thank you to Lucy for your words of wisdom, for your story that resonates with all of us, finding your voice, taking a pause, balancing, 
Thank you to Tanya for highlighting and expanding on what it means to be your authentic self. And of course, thank you to Lucy, Miguelina, and Jameer for sharing. And to my fellow bar leaders, thank you for joining us. This is the last day of Women's History Month, but we are breaking barriers, we are shattering glass ceilings, and I'm happy that our bar associations were able to get together. I'm inspired by all of you. So let's continue to mentor each other, to guide each other, and to teach each other how to be our authentic selves. Good night. Good night all, good night ladies. Wonderful being here. Good night everyone. Good night. Good night. I look forward to connecting with y'all. Yes, please. LinkedIn. I did. I didn't. I obviously didn't follow the role of a letter to myself. It that was, was so incredible. phenomenal. That was incredible. It really. Next was. time, follow instructions. That's oh, my next. No, thing. Please, no. <laughs> next time, do everything exactly the way you did it, which is by your own rules in your own way. It was Best. so 